What a crazy situation in the world today. These shootings of children in our schools. Unthinkable things. Frank Sinatra is buried with a fifth of Jack Daniel's whiskey and a pack of camels and ten dimes. Because he said he didn't want to be without a dime to make a call. I wonder how he plans to use ten dimes in eternity. Amazing. <coughs> Amazing. My message this morning, are you prepared for the coming storm? Now, immediately, some might say, oh no, pastor, not another doomsday message. <coughs> now, friend, let me tell you something. He's made me a watchman, and when I seek his face for a week and pour up my soul into what he gives me, that's what I have to preach. And after all, what I preach here goes out all over the country and around the world, and it's become a pulpit that I have to use to unburden my heart. Are you prepared for the coming storm? And you know that we never close a message without the good part. So if you have a problem with the first part, just hold on. You'll be encouraged before it's over, I'm sure. <clears throat> now, Holy Spirit, for those in the annex, those listening on screens, and watching, and those in this auditorium, I pray that you give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say. I have no doubt in my mind or spirit that you have spoken this word into my heart and my spirit. And I humble myself before you, Lord, to deliver it as your servant and watchman. Lord, I'm only one of many, but you have enlarged my heart. You have opened my heart so that I have cried your tears. I have seen your heart and I feel your passion. And I pray this morning that this word come forth in truth and power and unction. Lord, we're not working on the emotions. We're using the power of the Word of God anointed by the Holy Ghost. We pray you give us ears to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, I've been prophesying that America is heading for a financial holocaust. And I see probably two scenarios. One, one scenario will happen. It could be that the stock market suddenly goes down a thousand points and and everybody is in a short state of panic, and then it starts coming back. And I presume that's the way it may happen. And then everybody will say, well, it's all over. There's been adjustments made to the market. And then a euphoria hits here in the United States. And in that euphoria, the stock market goes wild with speculation. This week's New York Times said that thousands of lawyers, doctors, People from all walks of life have quit their jobs, quit their careers, and got their computers, and they spend all day now playing the stock market. That's all they do. It's, it, it, it's a gambling. It's gotten a hold of their spirits, and now <clears throat> it has become the golden idol. This is the golden idol of America now, the stock market and the sudden gain that has been promising to all of our people. Forty-three million Americans are now privately investing a one and a half to two trillion dollars in the stock market. They have leveraged their homes with 110, 125 percent mortgages so that they'll have an extra 50, 60, 70, 100 thousand dollars to play the stock market. And folks, when the bubble breaks, when it begins to crumble, there will be panic. Thousands and thousands of Americans are going to lose their home, they're going to lose their car, they're going to lose everything because they have invested it in the stock market, they're going to lose everything. And that by one of our government officials who looked right in the television screen, I heard, pointed a finger and said, you're foolish, you're gambling, you're going to lose it all. Not from a preacher, but from a major economist. Folks, what is coming is going to be horrendous, but it's going to be judgment for the bloodshed that God will not forgive. One thing God in all scripture has never forgiven is the bloodshed of the innocent. He has never ever in history forgiven this sin. No matter how many pray, no matter how many fast, I'll prove that to you. When judgment was coming upon Judah, 
Judah had been decimated, slain in ruins now, the prophet <coughs> comes forth and he says this, Surely at the commandment of the Lord has this come upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did for the innocent blood that he shed for he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood which the Lord will not pardon. The Lord will not pardon. I thank God for those who are calling for a national week or 30 days of fasting and prayer. I'm telling you folks, it's not going to change anything. Because of the bloodshed that God will not forgive. It's beyond, beyond the prayers of God because a line has been crossed. There is a line being crossed. Manasseh shed a rivulet of blood compared to the ocean of blood. In fact, we shed more blood in one year than Manasseh shed in all of his lifetime. In one year here in the United States of America. The Bible says bloodshed filled the streets which God will not pardon. Judgment for the innocent blood that was shed. <clears throat> now folks, if you just watch your news and become aware of the times you know that Indonesia now is going into depression. Suharto has resigned. Here's a empire of 17,000 islands in depression. Seven, the, the rupiah has, has collapsed. The whole nation now, 90% Muslim. And this is all a part of, of what is happening in the last days, the rise of the Muslim uh, religion. And when you look at conditions, you look at Russia. Russia is about to to default on its international loans. People have not been paid for months. No paychecks in months. Russia is rushing pale mill into a full-blown depression. Mexico, Argentina, Brazil are hovering right now at the point of devaluing their currencies which could spin the markets out of control. There's a drought in Mexico. It's covered all of Texas with smoke. They're warning of terrible dangers in Mexico. My wife is in Dallas, flew there Saturday, yesterday, and called me last night. And she said, David, it's just, it's just like uh, a cloud over the whole skies. This is way up in Dallas because hundreds of thousands of acres in Mexico in drought and burning now sending billows of smoke. Folks, what is it going to take to wake up America? Well, judgments are falling in nations all over the world. We are now surrounded by judgments. And God is saying, wake up, because the judgment, the bloodshed that you shed is far worse. The judgments coming upon you are going to be far more than what you see in the nations around you. I've said many times, I've pictured it, I've told you from this pulpit, I see a day coming when the president is in the Oval Office looking out the window in total panic. And the room is filling up now with Congress, congressional leaders, the head of the Federal Reserve and all the others. And suddenly he turns around, ash and white, and he says, what happened? How did it happen? What are we going to do? Greenspan, if he's there, whoever it may be, they'll offer these lame excuses. Well, there, there was no evidence, there's no sign, everything was under control, there was no inflation, and so they're going to try to explain it and they can't. And the Lord's going to say, you turned to your stargazers, you turned to your prognosticators, you didn't want God in your schools, you didn't want God in your government, you didn't want God in this society. Now turn to your prognosticators. Go get your fortune tellers and tell, let them tell you how to get out of this now. Folks, it's going to be something to behold. You said morals don't count. Now let us see what kind, how you handle this panic when it becomes aware to anyone in the nation that, that God has his hand in this. That God has it, his hand. The Bible says everyone shall know that God has had his hand in it. America is never going to be the same. Never again be the same. We're going to see, we've heard of assisted suicides now. We, we've got Dr. Kevorkian killing now going into the hundreds. Even 18, 19 year old kids who just don't want to live anymore because of their, their stress. And folks, we're going to see unassisted societies, masses of societies and uh, suicides of this country because of people who are, who are saturated with sex 
uh, uh, whether it was success and money, and when the success is gone and the money fails, they're not going to be able to handle it. Right now in Japan, Japan is going down into depression. Is ba the banks are closing, and by latest count, eight of their top financial leaders have committed suicide. Another last week. And it's just beginning. Now, I'm not talking about the end of American society. I'm talking about the humbling of America. How long it's going to last, I don't know, but God is going to humble America. I'm not talking about the end of our society. Are you prepared for what is coming? Have you made any preparations whatsoever? Now, when I talk about preparation, what I usually get, and my, my mail is being inundated right now from all over the United States, uh, my book about um, America's Last Call is at the publishers right now, at the printers, and be out next week. And word has gone out on my mailing list, and so I, I get all of these newsletters from, from secular prophets and others telling people to get ready because the 2YK, the, the failure of, of the computers, the mainline computers, uh, and, uh, and the 1st of January, because the computers are not lined up. For the year 2000, they're going to go back to 1900, wiping out so much information that runs this country. And there's, they are saying, get ready, prepare. And they, what, what they mean is stockpile food, get lanterns, get blankets, get long burning candles. And I mean, there's no end of the kind of preparatory talk that you hear in the land now. And it's not by preachers. These are, these are people that are not even religious people. Now, I have, I have no problem. It should, we are to be very prudent when we see these things coming. And Joseph prepared seven years of goods for the seven years of predicted, prophesied famine that was coming. But folks, there's a problem with all of this. And I want you to listen closely to your pastor now and listen to the heart. And I believe I have the mind of the Lord clearly on this. There's one thing that God despises. And that is, any of his children face the future with fear. That is not God's plan. And that's one thing God does not want people to do, to go someplace and find a shell, or a safe place somewhere. By the way, there are no safe places left. I don't care what mountain you go to, what desert you go to, there's no safe place other than in Jesus Christ. There is no safe place. But you see, you can stockpile, you can do all of these things. But the Lord says, when you see all these things begin to come to pass, look up and rejoice because your redemption draws nigh. You're to tremble only at one thing, and that's his word. You have to tremble at the sights. He said men's hearts are going to fail them for fear of seeing these things come on the earth, but not God's people, not those who are fully trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, God does provide for his people. Hiding places is a, a story of how God hid uh, uh, some, some people uh, from, the, from Hitler and Nazism. And uh, the, the whole history is filled with God in times of crisis, keeping his people in wonderful, miraculous ways. But see... When I talk about, are you prepared, I'm not talking about these physical preparations, the material preparations. I'm talking about spiritual preparations. I want to focus on that in my message today. Now, most people who study revivals know about the layman's revival that happened right down here on Chambers Street in, in the 1850s. A, a layman started a prayer meeting in a church I think it was Dutch Reformed Church right down on Chamber Street here in New York. And within, a, within six weeks, the place was so packed you couldn't get in. These were noon prayer meetings. And such crying, such weeping, such intense prayer went on. And that prayer revival spread all over New York City because at that time, most churches had abandoned prayer meetings here in New York City. Very few churches even had a prayer meeting. And people wanted to pray. There was such a spirit of prayer here in New York City that they went to churches, knocked on the doors, and demanded the doors be open for prayer meetings. And suddenly, all over the city, there were prayer meetings. But if you, if you look at history, it happened simultaneously with a stock market crash. There were no safety 
Yes, then. There, there was no unemployment compensation, no Social Security. When you were out of job, you were penniless, you were poverty-stricken, you were out. And suddenly, uh, just in the lower Manhattan, there were 30 to 50,000 unemployed men walking the streets. And they heard about the prayer meeting, they came in and they were driven to prayer. And that prayer revival, because it followed the trail of the recession, of depression, all through America, and it was tied to this time. Now, I want you to listen closely. In the days ahead, when this storm hits in its full fury, and the nation is reeling with fear and panic, people are going to flee from every false gospel in this land. They're going to flee from the prosperity gospel. How many are going to go to conventions where preachers are saying, God can make you rich if you get your faith straightened out? I saw a video of one of the well-known prosperity preachers in America in a convention last year in St. Louis. The most hideous thing I've ever seen in my life. And the man got up to sing. He said, while I'm singing, if you'll run, God will give you money while you're running. And the song was, run for the money, run for the money. People running all over the auditorium, running for money. How many are going to be running for money when the crisis hits? It is going to wash away all of the all of the glitz television. God has already written the obituary for Trinity Broadcast. He has written the obituary for every glitzy television program that's saying, send us a thousand dollars and God will pay all your bills. Folks, wake up. Where is your discernment? Whoever told you you could give a thousand dollars to somebody and suddenly all your bills are paid? My Lord, where is the discernment in the Christian mind? But folks, that's all going to be washed out. The obituary has already been written. It is all going to be gone because nobody's going to be able to afford to support it anymore. It'll all be shut down. <laughs> They are going, people who are unemployed, people who are in despair, people who are in panic, are going to go to churches, and they're going to go to the churches that have deceived them, that have given them nothing but entertainment, and they're going to say, why did you deceive me? They're going to be crying out, where are the men of God? Where can I get an answer? Where can I get the truth? I believe they're going to stand up in churches, and they're going to shake the fisted pastor's and say, why? The past five years have been this church. Why not a word about what was coming? Why didn't you know? If you're a praying man, why didn't you know what was coming? In 1987, when the stock market crashed, you remember I stood in this pulpit the day before and said, if you want to see what's going to come, meet me at Wall Street. We were there when it collapsed. And the newspaper, the Daily News, the next day said, Where were all the prophets? Where were the preachers? Where was the warning? What happened? Why didn't anybody tell us? That was from the Daily News. Can you imagine what is going to happen in the churches when they cry out against their pastors who have given them little ditties and given them little uh, skits? Nobody going to want to see a skit. One woman sent me a letter. She said, Pastor Wilkerson, I've been going to a church for years. Our pastor went to a convention and come back and said, we're going to change everything. And he started entertaining. He said, we've got songs now that go. And she wrote it out. Jesus is Lord, bitty bop, bitty bop, bitty bop. <laughs> How many are going to be bitty bopping when the judgment falls? I've been asked so many times, Brother Dave, do you believe that the last days when, when these hard times come that you're prophesying, do you believe there's going to be a revival in the land? Is it going to be one last great revival before Jesus comes? Now listen closely. You can be very sure that a great revival is coming, but it's not going to be the kind of revival we see in the land and what we call revival today. It's not going to resemble it at all. There's going to be one kind of revival only that can meet the needs of a panic-stricken, white-faced, fist-clenching, 
generation. There's only one kind of revival that's going to meet that need, folks, and it's revival of the spirit of truth. Truth. What do you do when people are shaken to the core and bewildered and they're ass and white with fear and terror? The Holy Ghost is going to come down. Yes, the Holy Ghost is going to be outpoured. But it's going to be an outpouring of divine truth, a fresh revelation of the risen Christ such as no other generation has ever seen. Because we have a generation today, a Pentecostal generation, especially a charismatic generation that has created a charismatic circus. People who are running for manifestations and are totally bankrupt of truth. Folks, it has always been God's answer to apostasy to bring forth a fresh revelation of who Jesus is. That's it been his answer to ruin. It's been his answer to depression and everything else to bring up again in full glory the all-sufficiency of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's what is going to come, a fresh revelation, until people begin to trust him through all circumstances, no matter what has happened to people wholly dependent, and a fresh revelation of the glory of Jesus Christ. Yes, there is a powerful ministry of the Spirit that's going to come to His church. You say, well, when the Holy Ghost comes, how is He going to manifest Himself? I tell you, it's going to be a manifestation far beyond anything you and I can conceive. Jesus Himself identified the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Truth. Listen to what he said, John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, when he comes, what's he going to do? Is he going to just wiggle people's bodies? Knock them down? I'm not against that when the Holy Ghost is truly doing it, and where there's been a message of conviction, and people are so convicted by their sin, they fall on their knees and on their face. I don't see in the Bible them falling down. I see them fall on their face. Then they fall because they are convicted of sin. Jesus said, He, the Holy Ghost, shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance what I have said unto you. Jesus said in John 16, 13, When He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. So if the Holy Ghost is going to fall in the last days, He's going to come as a teacher. And he's going to lead his church into all things. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. I believe that God is never caught unawares. He's not, the Lord foresaw everything that's happening. And he's had men shut away with himself in the secret closet. Been training for the last 10, 15 years. These are men of God that don't care about Prosperity. They don't care about being known. They don't care about money. They don't have any fear of people or man. They've been shut in with God and the Word. There's been a revelation of Jesus Christ. And now they're coming forward. God's bringing them. I see it happening in this church. God found a preacher in a little town of less than a hundred people. They've been shut in with God. Brother Caesar out of the Philippines and other, all of our staff here, we had a, 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 another young pastor, Brother Danny, is coming to our Bible school and coming to speak here. Shut in with God. Unknown pastors in little, little towns, unknown, unseen, and God has been training and getting ready for what is coming because there's going to be a demand for truth. There's going to be people saying, what's the answer? How do we get right with God? There is going to be a cry and a hue. Listen, if you don't believe that, pick up the New York Times today. And, and you read in the op-ed page an article called Coming, the most religious century in history. And this is by, of all people, non-religious, atheistic type Norman Mailer. And also from Vaclav Havel, the Czechoslovakian writer. And, and they, they, they said... These liberal writers have said the most, Havel said, we are living in the most atheistic society in the history of the world right now. 
And he said, it is all failed. He, he said, socialism has failed. Communism has failed. The age of reason and science has failed to satisfy man's needs for peace. Need for peace. Politics have failed. New age has failed. Men everywhere, even the most successful, are crying out, there has to be more to life than this. And now, most amazing of all, these writers are saying, religion now is going to break forth. The new century is going to be the age of religion. Men are going to seek God. And the amazing thing is that these two men, non-religious men, they're not talking about going to false religions. They say the revival is going to be a religion of Judaism and Christianity. That's in today's New York Times. I read it this morning. And I copied it down from my mess. I said, what's what I need, Lord, right there? <laughs> Folks, we're going to have, we will probably have prayer. This church will be open every night for prayer meetings and it'll be packed. Now, it doesn't mean everybody going to turn to the Lord. No, because according to Bible history, when judgment comes, people have a tendency to just go into an orgy, orgy, just to go wild. The majority will do that, but there's going to be a host of people. It's going to be the greatest time to evangelize in the history of America. Well, there's a revival coming, all right. Hallelujah. Sadly, we see ministers in charismatic circles today, especially Pentecostals, who talk about being spirit-filled, but they have no love, no passion for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, in the Old Testament, we have a very vivid picture of what happens to those who focus on the power of the Holy Ghost, divorced from the spirit of truth. Now, I want you to listen very closely because this is uh, a very clear description of what's happening in the charismatic movement today in the United States. I want to talk to you about Samson. Now, <clears throat> Samson's, Samson represents ministers and ministries who revel in the power of the Holy Ghost, but lightly esteem the spirit of truth. You know this story very clearly. And by the way, the Bible makes it clear that all these things happen. All of these stories in the Old Testament, for example, have happened. For examples, they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. God says, go in the Old, you want to know what's happening? Go in the Old Testament, get the type, and you'll see the antitype. And here we are right now. And, and Samson, I, I went back and said, Lord, teach me through the Old Testament, just like you said. And this is the example, so we better listen to it. And I do. Samson's fall and his failure in his ministry is a story of a man wholly unprepared for his time and the crisis that was upon him. Just like in the United States today, his nation was in ruin, it was in poverty, this nation is headed for the same crisis, and this man was called to be a deliverer. His birth had miraculous circumstances to it, just like your birth. Your new birth had miraculous circumstances to it. You were born again by the Spirit and by the Word of God. You were born again. This man was born with supernatural manifestations. He was raised as a deliverer, and he was commissioned or appointed from the womb to be before the Lord a Nazarite. That meant that he, by the way, the word Nazarite means to separate, consecrate, abstain. He had to abstain from drinking any wine. He couldn't even drink any fruit of the vine, whether it be figs or raisins. He could not cut his hair. That was a symbol of strength, only a symbolic of strength. It was no, there was, had, his hair had nothing to do. It had to do with the covenant that went with it. He was not to touch anything dead. He couldn't go to a funeral even of his father or his mother. He was totally consecrated unto the Lord for a purpose in a difficult time. And the whole story there is that only the separated Christian, only those separated from the world, 
No part of its lust, no part of its foolishness, no part of its death, its spiritual death or its physical death, no part of the death of the devil touching them. In other words, just as the New Testament says, come out from among them, be ye separate and clean, saith the Lord, then I receive you as my son and my daughter. Come out, come out, come out. Folks, we got Christians so mixed up in the world now, they don't know where the Christianity ends and the world begins. They're so absolutely saturated with the spirit of this world. As a young man, the Bible said the spirit of the Lord began to move him. Now, in Hebrew, that means a regular stirring. Something has happened as a young man. The spirit of God would come on and stir him. Now, folks, listen to me. This Holy Ghost in the Old Testament is the same Holy Ghost in the New Testament. And if Jesus identified him in the New Testament as a teacher who leads you into all truth, I can assure you that when the Spirit of God came on Samson, he was teaching him. He was teaching him more so that Samson, God would never send him as a loose cannon. He would not send him out to deliver Israel to just some man who's been trained. Even though an angel taught them how to raise this boy, it was dead letter. The Spirit of God moved on this young man, called to be a deliverer, and taught him, saying that your power, your authority, your strength comes by your separated life, by your obedience to my commandments. That is your strength and that is your power. Get it. Understand it. He was well taught. He was taught by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost doesn't come and just shake a body. The Holy Ghost doesn't come for no purpose. He comes to teach. He comes to make the Word alive. It's dead without the Spirit. He was a man taught and alive in the Spirit, but he had a problem. He had a driving lust. He had a lust for strange women. Now, it's amazing when you look at this man's life. First, there's a forbidden Canaanite, then a harlot in Gaza, and then a prostitute named Delilah. In fact, here's how his ministry began. And Samson saw a woman and said, get her for me. Read it. Right after, it says, he's a young man, the Spirit came upon him. His first mission, and, and, and God in his mercy was trying to turn that situation around so they could get his attention and, and, and get him to come against the enemy that kept him in bondage because Israel was under great bondage at the time. And on those earlier days, the Spirit had stirred him. He certainly had taught him. The Holy Ghost knew that this was in him. The Holy Ghost knows what's in all of us. He knows before he calls you to a work. He knows all everything about you. And he had trained this man. Because you and I know the Holy Ghost is a teacher. He would never send forth a man without a weapon. Without the power. Not just to, to lie in a part with his bare hands, but power over his sin. God had taught him that to mortify... That lust in him, he had to turn to the Holy Ghost and submit to the Word of God. He had to submit to the conviction of the Word of God. And he knew that. The scripture, the Bible says, If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you shall live. If you through the Spirit, you can't do it yourself, you can't do it in your own power. But that's why I've sent the Holy Ghost upon you. The Holy Ghost will tell you the Lord knows the way out of every temptation. And if you've got a lust, a driving lust in you, the Holy Ghost will teach you the way out if you've got an ear to hear and a willingness to obey. He knows the way out. If Samson lived today, he'd probably be addicted to internet pornography. Now, folks, I want you to listen to me. Our males are being flooded now from wives, who, even from wives of pastors saying, my husband locks himself in, he's in there half the night, and I go in and I watch and I peek and I see them watching pornography. God help you. God deliver you. There's a warning for some people watching and listening to me right now before you become totally deceived. But you see, Samson... It's evident from the first mission that he turned away from the truth. He turned away 
The Bible said he calls it abiding not in the truth, receiving not the love of the truth. Now listen to me, please. When, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you know you can't be saved without the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is given to all who ask. And the Holy Spirit was upon this man. Supernatural moving of the Holy Spirit. Supernaturally taught. That this man turns away from the truth. Now let me show you what happens when you opt for the power without the truth. All you get is empty theatrics. Do you realize how little this man accomplished because he had no love for the truth and he wanted to practice the power? He rips a lion apart with his bare hands. There's nobody around, nobody sees it, nobody is saved, nobody delivered. He traps 300 foxes, ties their tails together, burns down a few vineyards and a few wheat fields. Nobody sees it. In fact, they ask them, have to ask who did it. Nobody's delivered. Nobody's set free. God's not glorified. And now you see him going down to Gaza on his second missions trip. And the first thing he says, he saw a harlot and went into her. And he gets caught in the act. The Gazites surround the place. They say, let's wait till midnight. And so Samson just goes to sleep and waits a minute. He gets up and he, 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 he suddenly grabs a hold of the whole city gates and its bars, puts them on his shoulder and carries it four miles to the top of the hill. What a wonderful manifestation to no avail. There was sleep, nobody saw it. The city wasn't touched. There's nobody healed. There's no deliverance, but there's a demonstration of power. Theatrics. Beloved, let me tell you something. When you as a Christian want to run around the country and all you want are signs and wonders and you want to see people falling and flopping and you want to see all kinds of manifestations you want the laughing and you want to hear the lions roar and everything else I'm going to tell you once the spirit of truth comes all of that stuff is dealt with is dealt with because sin is exposed and there are many churches where thousands are coming and if a prophet stood in there began to expose sin under the spirit of truth most people would run out of it and if you do this, you are going to be given over to nothing but theatrics. Where the city is not touched, these churches do not touch the city. People are not saved. The people that are saved get a, some kind of a happy feeling. But three months later, they're right back because the truth has not built the foundation upon which to build. Theatrics. Folks, whenever the Spirit of God comes down there, there, I'm not against manifestations at all, folks. I have been under the power of God. I got called to preach when I was eight years old when the Spirit came on me, and I fell on my face for hours, weeping for nations at eight years of age. I know what that's all about, and I, I know God. But I also know that a Saul who's full of sin can be knocked down and get up and all kinds of theatrics where he rips off his clothes and lays all night and gets up and turns around to attempt to murder David the next few days because he had turned away from the truth. He had no love for the truth. He would not submit to the truth. I, I wonder how many are sitting here hearing me right now. How many of you come to church yearning for the truth and you say, Dear Lord, I pray that whatever the pastor preaches today, whatever that comes forth from the pulpit today changes my life. I don't care how deep it digs. God, go deep into my soul. Do you have that longing in you? Do you have that thirst for the living truth of God? That's the work of the Holy Spirit in you. That's when the Spirit of God is on you. Some people get the idea the Holy Ghost is not on them unless there's some kind of thing happening to their body. Folk, you can sit there in total silence and have the Holy Ghost working in you in greater power than you've ever known by loving the truth, ready to obey the truth. How many came this morning wanted to 
to get the truth of God and said, okay, what comes God? I'm going to hear it. I want it to change my life. How many can say that's what I came for today? That's the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Do you know, he carries this thing up and people say, what was that all about? And one of these days, folks, when this hits and all the curious crowds are gone, people are going to look back and say, what was that all about? To what purpose was it? Hallelujah. Folks, there's only one thing that sets people free. What is it? Just the truth. What is the power of the Holy Ghost? What is the power of the Holy Ghost? Let me read it to you. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. The preaching of the cross is the power of God that changes lives. Hallelujah. Those churches and pastors who, who are praying for the Holy Ghost to just come down and sweep away sin. Come and sweep people into the kingdom of God. They're sadly, sadly mistaken. That revival will never come. But the revival that is even here and now and is going to get white hot is that con sin convicting message that comes from ministers who've been shut in with God, who are no part of this world system, whose hearts are right before God, clean hands, pure hearts, nothing hidden in their lives, the book, the lives an open book, and they're not lusting after the things of this world or for fame or fortune or anything else. They've been shut in with God. They've seen the reality of Jesus. They're going to come forth with, Thus saith the Lord, and you'll know it because it'll burn in your heart with response. The Spirit in you will bear witness that this is the mind of God. Hallelujah. Well, let me tell you how I am preparing. I, I've been preparing. I have a Holy Ghost knowledge in me that in the not too distant future, all Americans, including the politicians, the business leaders, the masses of American workers, are all going to be crying for answers. They're going to be looking for reality. And boy, when you see that even these secular writers, atheists, are writing about what is coming. Lord, should the, it, it, folks, if the Lord tarries, I believe this is just what it's all about right here. A great awakening of the Word of God. They're going to turn away from stargazers and psychics and fortune tellers and prognosticators. They'll turn away from pastors and churches that have deceived them, gave them no warning. They'll want to know why it happened. They're going to know, they want to know how to take judgment off their back. Here's what I've decided to do. It's been, I think, eight months now when God began to stir my heart. I said, God, I'll look at the godliest man I know. I'll look at the prayingest man I know. I'll look at the man with the greatest revelation of Jesus that I know. And I'll not let him bypass me. I'm going to get a hold of God like I've never gotten a hold in my life. I'm going to seek Him. I'm going to shut myself in until I see Jesus and His all-sufficiency, Till I become so dependent on Jesus that all that comes out is Jesus and His prophetic Word, His straight Word, His honest Word. And that's what God wants for you. That's how He wants you to prepare. He wants you to turn off that crazy box and spend time with Him. Don't tell me you don't have time. Begin to bathe yourself in this Word. Bathe yourself in this Word. It's not enough to pray. I don't care if you pray 24 hours a day. If you're not into the Word, it's going to be in vain. And I tell you, if you're really praying, He'll drive you to this Word.
I have to tell you, this, as clearly as I see what's coming, I've never been more excited in all my years. And if you're really walking in the Spirit, you should be most excited about what God is about to do. Of all the opportunities that are going to be ours to reach people, we're finally opening their hearts. The people that are in panic and wonder want to know why you're not in panic. You're smiling where everybody's crying. And the peace of God is exuding out of you and it's sending out the rays of Christ everywhere you go. You'll be stopped in subways. You'll be stopped anywhere. Hey, what's wrong with you? Why are you smiling? You're going to be the only one on the subway smiling. <laughs> Folks, don't even think about your job. Don't even think about your house, your apartment. Don't even think about the safety of your family, your children. We've got a God that's big enough. He is big enough and powerful enough. <laughs> What's that to God to take care of this holy remnant? Hallelujah. Be encouraged in the Lord. But seek Him. The preparation, the preparation for the coming storm is that of your heart. Will you stand? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I promised you, Lord, I would speak without fear I would speak anything you told me to speak and you promised me if I'd be faithful to do what you told me to do that you would honor it by moving the hearts of people toward you awakening spirits awakening hearts and even encouraging them, encouraging them through this word and I pray Holy Spirit that you do that now do that all through the congregation in the annex and here in the main auditorium, Lord, I pray, pray, I pray that you would put in our hearts that we would not wait until the chastening falls. We would not wait for the crisis to strike. But we would be so full of Jesus, so given to the word of God, that nothing can shake us. Be unshakable. No fear in our hearts. Hallelujah. Remain standing while we sing a number. Just wait on the Lord for a moment. Just, just be still before the Lord. Please don't leave yet until the service is dismissed. Holy Spirit, what I should say to you in the way of invitation, and this is what I've received from the Holy Spirit, from the balcony and main floor and in the annex. The Lord told me to take authority over a spirit of fear. If you're here this morning, now, this can be fear of your health. I feel that very strongly. Some of you are really afraid. You have pain and symptoms, and it's worried you. I want you to come and be delivered of that spirit of fear. If you're here now and say, Pastor David, I, I, I know I love the Lord, but there's a fear that comes on me at times. It's almost like a spirit. I don't want it. I, I know the word and I love the Lord, but there's fear that comes on me. And I want you to come up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side down in the aisle. And you that are in the annex, if you go to the lobby of the annex, the ushers will show you where the door is into this building. And you can come right down the aisle. And here, I'll pray for you right here in the main auditorium. You can do that now. And if you're not saved, if you've backslidden, if you've been running from Jesus, if your heart's not right, and the Holy Ghost stirred you this morning. That's the stirring of the Holy Spirit. The Lord's getting your attention, saying, get it right. If you've got a besetting sin, you need victory over a besetting sin. Join these. Please move in tight. There are a lot of people coming, so you move in very, very tight, if you will. God bless you. As we sing this, open up your heart. Let's believe the Lord for a miracle today to deliver 
to deliver everyone in this place that is bound by fear that the Lord will break those chains let you leave this auditorium this house today without that fear let the joy of the Lord return to you with strength and power Amen not only for those that have come forward and are here in the auditorium but all over the house some of you didn't step out and you, you have that spirit of fear this morning I know the Lord told me to take his authority over this I don't have the authority but the Holy Spirit in me does and the Holy Spirit in you does and I'm going to ask the Lord to replace that spirit of fear with a spirit of joy and gladness in him I'm not talking about some kind of fading short lived giddiness no the real joy of the Lord is based on truth and if you lay hold of truth now the truth will deliver you and set you free where you say He's not given. The Bible says you, you take this one verse and be free. I've not given you the spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. That sound mind is the spirit of truth that abides in you. It's the mind of Christ through his truth. Now, you came because you've submitted yourself to truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is really the revelation of Christ. Look at me, please. I want you to be totally convinced before I pray with you that Jesus loves you. That he loves those who respond to His the call and urging of his spirit. And he's more anxious to give than you are to receive. That's all scripture. He's more anxious to give than you are to receive. I've always, when I read that verse, it says, God says, I'm not giving you a spirit of fear. And I said, well, Lord, if you didn't give it to me, why do I put up with it? I don't have to put up with it. God didn't give it to me. My flesh or the devil gave it to me or my conditions, and I'm not going to endure it. I am going to bring every thought into captivity, the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've got sin in your life, you don't have to beg and scream. You don't have to crawl. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I repent, and I want power of the Holy Ghost to mortify the deeds of my flesh. And all the Lord, by his Spirit, will rush to you. He will rush to you right now. And we're going to take authority now. Authority in Jesus' name. And I want everybody in this building. Now, the Bible makes it clear. Maybe you've never done this. You may be visiting and have never seen this done or never practiced it yourself. But I'll show you five places, at least in the Bible, it says, I would men lift hands. Lift your hands. Lift holy hands. That's a sign of surrender and say, Lord Jesus, here I am. Pray it with me now. Right out loud. Jesus, I surrender all my doubts and fears, my sins. Everything I'm like you, Jesus. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come now and fill my body and my mind with a spirit of gladness because I'm going to give to you the spirit of fear and I want it to be replaced by your spirit of gladness. Keep your hands raised while I pray. And you pray too right now as I pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we take the authority of the Holy Spirit of God over the spirit of fear, condemnation, and guilt. I have heard people say, I repent. I've heard people say, I am sorry. And Lord, you said, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. All unrighteousness, we believe that. Now, Holy Ghost, drive out the spirit of fear of everyone in this house. Drive it. Remove it. Take it by the roots and cast it out. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the name above every name, the name that has power over every power of Satan, go in Jesus' name all your spirits of fear and depression and stress and anxiety. Oh, God, <coughs> give us now the spirit of gladness and joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy and gladness in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. This is the conclusion of the message.